If you've ever gone down the jazz rabbit hole, you've definitely come across Fela Kuti and Ginger Baker, two of the most fascinating musicians of the 1970s. But what's even more fascinating is that these two men, one a revered activist, community leader, and one-time Nigerian presidential candidate, and the other, well, Ginger Baker, had enough common ground to record together, open a studio, and remain close friends for many years. Their stories together in Lagos, Nigeria are like a beatnik novel on crack. Their constant run-ins with border security, Fela's hippie-like commune, the drugs, the women, the battles against the Nigerian army. It's amazing either man lived past their 30s, to be honest. At the same time, though, they had terrible luck when it came to their careers. It seemed like every time they caught a break, an unlikely mishap would send the whole house of cards crashing down. Today, of course, Fela Kuti is starting to get more recognition, but it's a long time coming. The story begins with English drummer Ginger Baker. Following the breakup of Cream and Blind Faith, Baker flew down to Ghana in Africa for a change of scenery. While he was there to visit musician Guy Warren, Baker was fascinated by the unique music he kept hearing on the radio, which turned out to be a new genre of Nigerian music called Afrobeat. Ginger hopped on a plane to Nigeria's largest city, Lagos, and linked with an old friend, Fela Kuti, a musician he'd met in London a decade earlier. Fela was at the forefront of this new genre, performing at the legendary Africa Shrine nightclub with his band Africa 70. While Ginger spent a bit of time hopping between countries, he returned to Nigeria a few months later, driving all the way from Europe in a Land Rover. He was joined by filmmaker Tony Palmer, and the footage is ridiculous. You see them driving across non-existent roads, running into border security, sweet-talking their way past checkpoints. They eventually reach Nigeria, and Palmer captures a performance by Fela Kuti, as well as a jam between Baker and some Nigerian musicians. Using his music business connections, Baker offers to fly the whole Africa 70 band to England, where they record at Abbey Road Studios. Ginger Baker was on drums alongside Fela's drummer Tony Allen, giving the album a massive percussive sound. The band also planned a European tour with appearances on British TV. It was expected to be a huge boost for the Africa 70 and the Afrobeat genre in general. However, a few weeks before the tour launched, Fela called Ginger in a panic, believing their English manager would not front the steep cost to fly his live band around. In a last-ditch effort to raise some funds, Fela sent a friend on a plane to London with a large drum full of weed. However, the poorly hidden drugs were easily seen by customs. Ginger got away with the fine, but Fela was barred from entering the UK, essentially ending the band's hopes for world fame. In today's world, where bands seem to split up over the most arbitrary reasons, this would probably be the end of the partnership. However, both Fela and Baker seemed to occupy a rare, almost manic headspace when it came to music. Their musical passion seemed to trump everything else including petty disagreements, but also financial sensibilities, commitments to friends and family, and even their own common sense. For instance, in the autobiography of Fela's drummer, Tony Allen, he writes that Fela had a policy of never playing songs live that were already on a record. This would lead to multiple occasions where audiences would riot, because they went through the whole concert without hearing their favorite songs. Fela, like Ginger, was also known to have a strong temper. According to biographer Michael E. Veal, he would abusively chastise his band members whenever they made a mistake, sometimes giving out fines as a penalty. Drummer Tony Allen also wrote about how Fela would intentionally humiliate band members that were talking too friendly with women who hunt around at their practices. The idea being that Fela should have these women for himself. During the early 70s, Fela had converted his home into a commune for band members and their families to live in, and governed the so-called Kalakuta Republic, much like his practices. Fela was judge, jury, and executioner, able to impose penalties such as lashings or confinement in a makeshift prison. For Ginger's part, his aggression is far less political in nature, but you can take one look at some of his notable quotes about musical peers to understand his temperament. Likewise, the mere fact that he would up and leave his wife and children to travel aimlessly across a new continent, potentially getting shot by border security, shows how much he was guided by raw musical passion, at the cost of reckless indifference to pretty much everything else. For better or worse, this extreme passion for music is inextricably linked to their immense talent and insanely productive careers. And it's a big reason why neither were particularly discouraged by the drum full of marijuana. Fela Kuti continued playing in Nigeria, and Ginger Baker soon joined him, 
this time bringing a truck full of recording equipment with him across the Sahara Desert. The Ark Studio would soon open, and it was the best studio in Nigeria at the time. Coincidentally, Paul McCartney was looking for a new place to record his Band on the Run album, and ended up settling on Lagos, Nigeria. Baker was thrilled by the prospect of having a Beatle record at his studio, and the amount of exposure it would bring them. According to Baker, arrangements were made, and Baker and his crew secured the Ween's visas to enter the country. However, when the band arrived, the gear was routed elsewhere. In a huge middle finger to Ginger Baker and Fela Kuti, they were going to record at EMI's local studio instead. This led to a tense standoff, where Fela Kuti and 40 of his followers forced the sessions to a halt. Accounts differ as to whether Fela was seeking revenge for his friend or simply upset that Paul McCartney was exploiting or selling out African music. But nonetheless, Paul managed to convince Fela that his intentions were good, and the sessions were allowed to continue. The Weens actually did end up recording at Baker's Ark Studio for one day, laying down the track Picasso's Last Words. However, the incident began a series of setbacks for the studio. EMI would soon monopolize the Nigerian market, signing contracts with many local musicians, and an exclusive deal with the only record plant in the country, forcing Baker to press records back in England at a much higher cost. His studio would close after only a couple years, and at a huge financial loss for him and his partners. While Ginger worked on the studio, Fela continued building a following for his band in his commune-slash-political movement, the Kalakuta Republic. Fela had always been critical of the Nigerian government for their corruption and classicism, which he saw as a carryover from the colonial days. However, his squabbles with police intensified after Fela and his followers were arrested for possessing small amounts of weed and jailed for several months. For years, they played an increasingly bitter cat and mouse game. Fela would antagonize the police by song or by violence, and the police would attack him back. This escalated until, in 1977, a thousand soldiers raided his commune, nearly beating Fela to death. Baker's relationship with Fela had been fading at this point, due in part to Baker's newfound passion for polo, which found him hobnobbing with many of the same elites Fela Kuti was fighting against. However, the escalating tension with police was the final straw for Baker. He soon packed up and left Nigeria for good, returning to England to focus on the baker Gervitz army. The men wouldn't see each other again until 1990, when Fela Kuti performed one of his last shows in Los Angeles. However, it was an emotional reunion. As Baker wrote in his autobiography, I actually gave him a kiss, and I've only ever kissed two guys in my life. The other was Eric Clapton. While some of the stories are more infamous than others, What's incredible is the sheer number of them, one setback after the other, and how it never seemed to break either man. It's hard to imagine any rock band today driving their tour van across the Sahara Desert, jerry-rigging the engine when it breaks, and bribing border guards after getting held at gunpoint. Don't get me wrong, we should definitely be grateful we don't need to do these things, or that we can smoke a joint without risking a guerrilla war with the police, but there's something awesome about the fact that these guys actually experience these things and have the soundtrack to prove it. Oh!